one. Hey everybody, I'm Courtney Cooper and this is a remote training tip Tuesday because we're here at Bruce's Field for the last Shepherd Show. And so uh, Dr. Ashley Taylor and her vet tech Bryn and Farley and Star by Far have joined us today to discuss pre-purchase exams. I'm a partner in Excel Star Sport Horses and a five-star event rider and an owner of Two Square Farms. We sell between 50 and 60 lenses a year and so I do a lot of pre-purchases and so I thought it might be fun to talk to people about what their questions are about pre purchases. So we're going to run through this. Dr. Taylor has about 20 minutes to spend with us during her busy day. Um, but we're going to run through this. We may have to pick up more um, later. Um, so we can do the riding portion of a pre-purchase exam later. But for now, um, I will let Dr. Taylor walk you through what we look for for in a pre-purchase and then I will also add my two cents. If anybody has questions, um, we'd love to have your questions. Reese is on the camera so she can relay those to us and we'd also love to find out where you are watching from. So with that, I will let Dr. Ashley Taylor take it away. Um, the first part of the exam for me usually starts with talking to the buyer or the buyer's agent. Um, learning a little bit about the horse that they're purchasing, um, getting a background from them on uh, what they've learned about the horse, maybe any concerns that they have found with riding the horse or spending time with the horse, um, expectations of what that horse is going to do for a job, um, and then also to learn a little bit about um, you know, what kind of risks they're maybe willing or not willing to take. Uh, to me, a pre-purchase exam is really about risk assessment for the buyer um, and every buyer's uh, degree of risk that they're willing to take is a little bit different so okay. it's important sure um, I will add that I think it's real important to ask and receive all the vet records on a horse so that you know the horse's previous history and you know most horses if they have done anything have oops we're right in the way um, any horses have done anything um, they're going to have some history of having something happen and so um, that's fine but it's it's not as the seller it is not my um, it's my duty to share that information because I don't want to make someone else and so um, I think it's really important to get that record helps you to assess risk when you know more about the horse's past um, and what kind of injuries that they've had, what kind of joint injections they've had, if they've had history of colic, colic surgery, etc. So um, those are always good questions for you to ask when you're going to see a horse for the first time or second time um, and also to relay that information to the veterinarian before they purchase the horse. Um, so I, with that I would also say a lot of people, a lot of sellers sometimes get scared about providing that information, but my thought is that every horse has a home and you have to be willing to disclose that so that the horses are, have the best chance of being successful in their new jobs. Do we have any questions? Yes, Sydney B says, uh, hi from Kentucky, where did Bryn get that cute coat? <laughs> Ooh, smart pack. <laughs> <laughs> in the south, unfortunately. All right, um, here we go. So once we have done that, then I get a thorough history when I'm at the exam from the seller, um, including a lot of routine questions, um, which we can go through um, probably at a later date. Um, once we have a thorough history on the horse, um, we start with a physical exam in the barn. So. Um, I always kind of do my exam in the same uh, fashion over and over again. Um, and I have a very thorough form that I fill out as I do it. Um, essentially, we're looking at the horse's um, vitals to start, making sure that they have a normal resting heart rate, normal rhythm. Uh, we're making sure they have a normal temperature, that their breathing's normal. Um, we look in their, at their eyes, we look in their mouth, um, we listen to their lungs, listen to their abdomen, make sure that their GI tract's moving normally. Um, 
we're gonna basically put our hands on every part of the horse, uh, look for any abnormalities, um, anything that's minor from a, a skin wound or um, you know anything that could be indicative of a bigger problem like muscle atrophy. Um, we're gonna point out any kind of small blemishes. Um, we palpate the horse's legs very thoroughly, um, paying close attention to the soft tissue structures in their legs and their joints. Um, we'll usually hoof test them, look at their conformation, um, look at their shoeing. So there's a lot that's involved actually just standing in the barn. Um, a lot of times I also just take note of the personality of the horse, how easy they are to work on um, versus how difficult they are. Uh, that can obviously range when we're doing bettings on young horses that maybe aren't as trained versus older horses that have been handled quite a bit. Um, once we have all that information, then we take the horse out and we do a moving exam with them. Um, so, if, for example, we're going to, because Farley's mine, um, not that you know, but at the moment. Um, any other questions before we get going? Nope. No other questions. So, for example, if you were to look at Pam Dr. Pam, Why don't you come a little closer because that way you can hear us. Change my hand position as well. It's my hand. Oh gosh. There we go. Are we back on? Yep. Okay, very good. Yeah, I mean, I think the the first thing is like he seems like a, a, a nice young horse. He's got, you know, an interested eye, but he's standing here quietly and good for us. Um, he's got a nice big shoulder. I'd say he's a little bit light on weight. Um, sometimes that can be because the horse has a problem or it can also just be where they are in their training and development. Um, so that's something that we'd, you know, maybe ask more questions about or make recommendations to the buyer about how they could kind of help with that. Um, I haven't really looked at him otherwise. So you can see normal steel shoes on with um, quarter clips. So that is pretty standard for uh, most of the event horses that we see. Um, you know, I think that overall, um, the big thing too that we'll look at is kind of how he moves and how he uses his body is a long back, um, which is helpful in some jumping horses, um, but also can make them a little bit weak. Um, and that is something that we usually kind of discuss with the buyers as well. Um, so without kind of really putting my hands on him and I'm poking uh, around doing an exam, yeah, that's kind of what I would say. So she gets that. she gets a real good general impression. So again, she would have taken her hands, she would have run him down his legs. He's actually a relatively clean-legged horse. Um, he's a young horse, so he doesn't have a lot of blemishes, just play wounds from his pasture mates. Um, so why don't we go ahead and talk about the moving exam? <laughs> So the first thing that we do is we just we get a baseline um, uh, look at how their soundness is. So I always watch them in the walk first, moving away from me and toward me, um, just to kind of get an idea how um, they move, if they're straight, um, if they have any kind of abnormalities in the walk. Um, then Bryn will jog them away and then to me in a straight line, once again looking at the way they move, if they have like a paddle or if they wing at all when they're going. So why don't, um, why don't we do that so you can make yeah, comments on this for sure. So why don't we come down here and you can stand right next to her. You want to oh, go we're going to go way. that way. Okay. wants to go this way. I'm just um, going to assist. It's always helpful to have someone who can be here to assist if your horse isn't used to jogging them. So this horse steps out wide behind. You can see as it walks. As Courtney mentioned, straightness is really key when you're evaluating the horses, having a good handler that keeps them on a straight line and then potentially having a second handler that can help move the horse like forward. Again, Let's do the trot this time. Okay. 
sometimes in the young with the young horse we have to kind of jog them down and back a couple times to train them a little bit and make them understand what we're asking of them get them used to listening to the handler okay let me do one more time um, as well as looking at how the horse is moving we're obviously looking for any overt lameness Boy. So to me, he looks sound. He's obviously a little wiggly here and there because he's not in a perfectly straight line. And we don't have good straight ground here either, but overall it's really good. So once we have a baseline on the horse and know what their normal free way of moving is, then we do a series of flexion tests. Um, the flexion tests are basically different um, ranges of motion that we put the limb through and we hold them for about a minute at a time and have the horse jog off and see if that elicits a lameness. Um, the lameness degree in, um, as far as just lameness baseline goes from zero, which is a sound horse, to five, which is a non-weight bearing horse. Um, when we're grading flexions, um, it can vary a little bit between veterinarians, um, but usually they're graded on a scale that's just mild, moderate, or severe. So the the positivity deflection essentially when we're grading it we're looking at the degree of lameness that we created post flexion and how long that degree of lameness lasted for um was and it I'll, and i'll add here to, as well <clears throat> when um they're doing a lameness exam sometimes you're going to have a horse that flex positive an older horse that flexes positive for example on a left front fetlock um I, as a buyer, am always less concerned if they flex positive on the right front fetlock. Similarly, like I like to see that the limbs are the same left to right. You know, if it's a mild or moderate flexion, you want to make sure that the horse is sort of um, consistent between limbs. If you've got one limb that is uh, significantly worse, that always makes me a little bit more concerned. Yeah, and I think obviously flexions are, are very... Um, you know, can range and vary from day to day. Um, and we know that just from, you know, cases I've had where I've flexed them multiple days in a row and sometimes they're more positive than the following day. They might be less positive. Um, it can really vary depending on the horse's degree of work and also, um, you know, what they have going on. Um, the goal of flexion tests are really to get a baseline on the horse and also to kind of alert the veterinarian if there's maybe something underlying in the region that you're flexing that you want to investigate further with imaging, um, like ultra, ultrasound or uh, x-rays. And, so, and on that note, when you're doing a pre-purchase, Dr. Taylor, and you've got a horse that maybe shows a little bit of lameness or a problem with the flexion, um, as a buyer, who's responsible for working up that lameness? How do you decide how to deal with if your horse, if you really, really like the horse and the mm -hmm. horse for some reason comes up and it's bothered, um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, so it's a, you know, that's a very good question because most horses have something on a vetting, whether it is a positive flexion or an actual lameness. Um, the lameness to me is always the responsibility of the seller to work up. Um, and so oftentimes if the horse is lame at the time of presentation for the exam, we will send the horse back or offer to block the horse and try to find out what the lameness, what's localize. causing the lameness. Localize yes. The lameness. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Try to localize the lameness. Um, and bill the seller for that. It's not really the responsibility of the buyer to try to determine why the horse is lame um, on presentation. However, if the horse comes back with a positive flexion um, and is sound, normally that kind of is the responsibility of the buyer to you know, do any imaging that might make them more comfortable to assess why that flexion was positive. Um, I've had it get bounced back to the seller in some cases, but I think having a, a open line of communication throughout the exam um, is really important so that if any issues do arise and somebody, the buyer becomes uncomfortable, 
um, that can kind of get sorted and the seller may be willing to pay for some of the, the imaging or the blocking that needs to happen. So. Okay, so we've done, we, we've touched them and we've looked at all of the body, uh, you know, systems and we're pretty happy and we've walked them and jogged them and flexed them. Yeah. Then what do we do? So the other thing that we'll do just after reflection is I put them on a circle um, and look at their soundness on a circle as well. Um, ideally, and this can be tricky sometimes when you're vetting horses on um, different farms, but ideally we lunge the horses on a hard surface on kind of a larger and smaller circle. So a 20 meter circle being a large circle and a 10 meter circle being a small circle. Um, and we do the same on a soft surface. Oftentimes I'll see the horses canter on their own as well on a soft surface. Um, once that part is done, then um, I watch them under saddle. Uh, so we have a rider, walk, trot, canter around. Um, and horses that are being purchased to be upper level event horses, we will gallop them um, as well. And we listen to their heart rate basically just post exercise while their heart rate's elevated to make sure there's not any exercise induced issues with the heart, um, which is really important in event horses. And so like for an event horse or a show horse or even a riding horse, let's say um, I as the buyer, you, you come to me and you say, oh, this horse has a heart murmur. How concerned do I have to be about things like that? So heart murmurs can be very concerning and they can also be not concerning at all. So the answer to that is always to get more information. If there's a murmur and it sounds, um, you know, the veterinarian sounds concerned about it. We have um, an internal medicine specialist that we work with at our practice um, that will do echocardiograms, which is ultrasounding the heart and putting an ECG um, and looking at the heart's uh, normal function and essentially determining is this an issue that is going to, um, you know, be a problem with exercise or not. So oftentimes, especially in these horses that are upper level event horses, if there's some cardiac abnormality that we can hear with our stethoscope, we'll often just get more information um, at that point in time. And sometimes you just have to kind of put the rest of the exam on hold to gain that information and then revisit the other parts of the exam. Um, so it sounds like for the, the lameness exam and the lunging exam, and if something comes up, more information is always better. Yes. And, and it's not necessarily a point at which you stop the exam. Um, but again, having records of the previous horses, uh, the horse's previous history might lead you one way or the other. Um, so those are all important things. Do we have any other questions? Yes, we do. Jen Brown Shank asks, would you also recommend a full neuro exam at the time of purchase? So that's another thing that we do um, either after the written exam or before the written exam. Um, but yes, we do do a full neurologic uh, exam on these horses. So um, we do put them through a variety of tests to essentially determine if they have any proprioceptive de deficits or any other um, abnormalities that would be you know, concerning, questionable. Um, once again, if we need more information, um, we have a neurologist that we work with that sometimes we'll send them over to her and have her take a look at them as well. So she has the worst job in the world, that's so. Yes, she does have the worst job. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a very important part of the exam. So kind of for a pre-purchase exam, it's always good to ask the veterinarian performing it. But um, for our practice, what we include in our pre-purchase exam is essentially a full physical exam uh, not, we look at their eyes, so we have a um, that we do a dental exam, but we do not use a speculum generally. Some practitioners will. Um, we do a full soundness exam, a written exam, a neurologic exam, um, and then depending on that, we look at uh, you know do imaging. So very frequently, we'll do a full set of radiographs, ultrasounds, if the history or the exam. Um, you know, we think that the horse needs something ultrasounded, um, and then blood work as well at the time of purchase, depending on um, if there's a drug screen that the buyer wants to run um, clinically. If we feel like the horse looks like it needs any baseline CBC or chemistry run, 
um, and then sometimes we will run EPM and Lime um, titers as well at the time of purchase. And so in terms of radiographs, vary a lot um, in it also it's going to depend a lot on the buyer so uh, a lot of buyers are working within a budget and so the radiographs are the most important part of the exam um, if money isn't an option or um, if you're buying a horse that somebody says I don't want to take any risk on then I always recommend doing a full set of radiographs just because the more information you have the better of a decision that you can make um, about purchasing the horse and understanding a little bit about what um, is going on. So, um, ideally, you know, to me, when I'm helping people decide to buy a horse or not, I, I think more is better than less. Um, if you have a certain budget, um, then usually the veterinarian can help you Yes, Chloe asked, um, oh gosh, it went away. There it is. What blood test do you like to run at the time of a PPE? So once again, it depends a little bit on the horse um, and what, you know, the buyer wants. Uh, usually a drug screen is pretty common um, in our practice just to make sure that everybody's being honest, that the horse hasn't been medicated um, either in his joints or systemically. And as a seller, I love drug screens. I hate the time they take, but it protects me because then they can't come back and say the horse was drugged um, or had any sort of uh, medication. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think a CBC chemistry is always helpful, especially saying a horse like Farley, where maybe it's a little um, underweight <laughs> and you just want to make sure that the horse is healthy. I think that's good. Um, Lime multiplex and EPM titers um, can be helpful, but we also know with those tests it can get a little bit gray because they're just telling us about exposure and not necessarily clinical disease. So you have to use also the guidelines of the clinical exam. If the horse seems a bit weak um, or has some potential muscle wasting, then definitely EPM titer goes right on the list. Um, probably Lyme as well. Um, some also, as we talked about, just talking to the buyers before they purchase the horse. Some buyers were all, you know, basically uh, products of the experiences that we've had. And so some people say, I've had a horse with EPM and I want to test this horse, or I've yeah. had a horse with Lyme disease and I want to test this horse before I buy it. So um, we always are very happy to, to do that. Um, you know, yeah. make sure everyone's comfortable. Any other questions before we sign off? Please? No. All right, guys, well, we've really enjoyed having Ashley and Bryn and Farley. Thank you to Reese for videotaping. We hope everybody is safe and healthy, and we will look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for Trading Tips Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in.